Carter. Um, I want to start with that. that uh, my name is Ivan Kadiev. I'm a senior software engineer at Software as Arthur said previously, and I'm going to present to you today um, what is new in Java 17. Um, since you all know that it's a pretty large, broad topic, um, there are a lot of things changing from version to version. I will be mainly um, speaking about language changes between different versions from Java uh, 11 up until Java 17. What new can you expect? But before that, I would uh, like to start with um, a brief uh, overview of the last latest versions. As you all know, 8, 11, and 17 were our last latest versions. And in front of the screen, there are three dates per version. And on each column, the first uh, date is the release date of the uh, said version. The second one is the uh, end of support date. And the third version is the end of uh, the extended support of the specific version, as you, as you may know latest versions have extended support. Other versions do not have this. Since they are um, they're more keen, uh, lean on to be used for ex uh, extended period of time, and so many companies decide to uh, stick to the specific version uh, until the new latest version is released. So it's not very common to see companies switching from version to version, like uh, incre incrementing by one. For example, let's say if the latest version is 11, it, it's rarely that you see that the next version to be used is 12. Java 17 um, was released uh, in September last year. Uh, the, end, uh, the end of the support is going to be 2026. And also the end of the extended period is going to be in uh, 2029. So let's start with some language changes for the set uh, version. One of the things that I would like to start with is one that I'm really um, interested in. I really like that it's uh, such a nice feature that we have is that uh, is the enhanced switch in Java. So previously in um, Java 11, <coughs> For each uh, example that I'm going to give, I'm going to say Java 11, since this is the latest version before that, and I'm going to compare to the new changes, even though this is also available in Java 8, let's say. In Java 11, uh, previously the switch statement looked like this. You're probably very familiar with it. You have a switch where you switch a variable. You have a bunch of cases. And inside of cases, you do something and then you do a break so that you don't fall into the next case uh, if you want to keep it separate. What is new in uh, Java 12, actually, what was introduced as a preview feature was the switch, switch expression. So similarly to the previous example, you can see that you have a case, but then you have this arrow instead of the column and you have just a single statement. What is interesting here is that this example actually is absolutely the same as in behavior as the last example. But you can see that here the break uh, statement is missing. This is due to the fact that this, um, as in syntax, looks really similar to a lambda expression. And this, the new switch expression knows that the, uh, each line with the arrow is going to represent a single statement and overflowing is not allowed by default, which means that if we say that the animal is a monkey, then the only thing that is going to be printed to the console is this is a monkey, which means it's not going to overflow in line. As, uh, as I said, this is the default behavior with switch expressions. But why are we going to use this? Well, this introduces uh, something which is really cool uh, for, for uh, Java developers. Since we had this feature in other languages, such as TypeScript, for a while, uh, but we never had this pre, uh, pre prior to Java 12 and Java, now switch can return a value. What this means is that we can create um, a declaration of a variable here, as I have done with final string text, which is a reference variable, variable which I'm assigning a value to a switch. What, what this means is that the switch is going to return some kind of value, which is going to be based upon which case or if 
that's no case in the default statement is the one that is uh, going to be executed is going to be returned to the switch. So let's say that the animal is monkey. Then in this example, the text is going to be equal to uh, the case monkey, which is going to return this string, this is a monkey. Text is going to be, this is a monkey, and this a string is going to be printed to the console. Um, and one more thing which is really cool about this uh, switch statement, uh, switch expression, is that now you can actually, similarly to Lambda expressions, you can wrap, wrap each case with a, a block. Uh, where you can do numerous things, not just the one liner. So let's say we fall into the default, the animal is, a, let's say a tiger. We don't have a case for tiger yet. This means that in, we are going to um, fall into the default statement. We are going to print to the console unknown, and then we are going to return uh, what is it, which is going to be uh, saved to the reference variable text. And we are going to print at the end of uh, the method, we are going to print what is it as well. This is really cool uh, since we can do complex things with a switch, with a switch and then we can return uh, everything to the variable. Uh, you can see that we have a new a reserved word, which is called yield. Uh, yield is the one uh, which you have to say inside, in this case, inside this switch uh, expression, it's not return. Um, and one more thing that's really cool is that you can now use this word in the old syntax uh, uh, that we had. For example, if you use this, uh, this one here inside uh, Java 12 uh, or later, then you can use the yield word as well uh, instead of a instead of return. So it's this uh, reserved word is going to work in both situations after Java 12. Uh, more or less, that's, that's it about the switch statement. I think it's very useful. Uh, it makes Java less verbose. And I think that each of, uh, each of the things that I'm going to talk today is that one change by another is making Java a little bit less verbose as it is right now. The next uh, topic that I want to discuss as text blocks. Um, text blocks is something that I really like uh, inside uh, the new uh, Java versions uh, due to the fact that uh, previously in Java 11, we had to do a text block like this. I think many of you have seen this before and it's really hard to read and it's really pain to write. So if you see here, uh, I created an example with a simple JSON uh, for a monkey or an animal, let's say, with the uh, well-known uh, curly brackets. Then you have the spaces. Then you have some key value pairs. And the output is written below in the slide. You can see the curly brackets. And you can see that there is a key ID with some number. You, you have a key kind with some string value monkey. Um, it's really nice to see it in the output like this. And when you serialize it and, for example, return it to the front end, but when you have to uh, hard code it inside of Java, it's really easy to make a mistake and it's really hard to see what you're writing. So uh, in Java 13, this feature was introduced called text block, where you can actually do those three um, quotes. And afterwards you write whatever you like and then it's going to be displayed in the same format as you, you have written. So I think it, this makes it very clear what your intentions are. You're less prone to errors and it looks uh, really better than the previous one. It's really uh, easy to write it. You can just copy paste it now. Um, so this is going to introduce um, a easier way to hard coding such things as HTML text, JSON, and other things where you had to previously uh, paste something inside the Java, Java document, but you had to refactor the whole thing. Um, specifically, one thing that comes to mind when you look at this example is, let's say if you want to have a little bit more spaces to the right, well, how can you achieve this? How is white space, uh, white space formatting being deal, dealt with in this example? Well, it's kind of relatively easy. I'm not sure if it's uh, kind of intuitive or not, but if you place spaces like so, 
here in this example, if, if it has uh, like three spaces or one tab after uh, each thing, uh, then you're going to be presented with the same way space formatting as you have done here uh, in the console, in this example. But it's, it's pretty uh, important to see that those white spaces here that are denoted with the gray uh, rectangles, they are relative to the three uh, quotes that are below the code. So if you want to have some uh, white space uh, before your string, then you have to adjust it to the uh, three quotes that are uh, below the code. And more or less, that's it that I want to show you with text blocks. I think they're great and they're making the code less verbose as well. Uh, one important change, in my, in my opinion, and the new versions of Java is our records. So let's see an example here. So previously, uh, when we wanted to do a data class, what we do is we do this. We make a public class with, with a certain name. Here in this example, I have used immutable animal since records are immutable. So I want to skip it uh, with the same restrictions. We have, let's say, two variables here, which are private and final, as we want to have the en, uh, encapsulation in the class, uh, which are long ID and string kind. And what we do next, we want to have an OARCS constructor. Let's say we need getters for sure, equals and hash code if we want to use it in, structure, uh, in structures like hash map, and to string, which is not required, but it's uh, easier to use when you want, for example, to debug or print line something to the console. Um, as you can see, I've written some long box annotation here just to keep it concise. But if we want to actually write this by ourselves, we know that this is kind of a hefty code and it's dependent on the whole, how many uh, fields do we have. So if we have a class, for example, with let's say 10 fields, then we have 10 getters, 10 getters, we need um, a constructor equals and hash code, which is length, uh, which both of them are lengthy because there are a lot of uh, fields. We need a two string and so on. And you know that this is at least 70 or 80 lines of code, which are um, just most of them are, we don't need them to actually explicitly shown because we know uh, how it's done. They're done by convention. Um, I hacked it kind of with those Lombok annotations because we previously had it. But for example, let's say that you don't want to use Lombok in your project. Well, Java wanted to uh, address this uh, issue with uh, the new uh, feature that they had in Java 14 called record. So uh, record as here shown immutable animal, which is a public record, is the same structure as the one above. So. This is the syntax, how would you write a record? And inside the brackets that you see, you just provide the uh, uh, types and uh, names of the variables that you want to have. So what I've done here, I uh, created a public record immutable animal with long ID and uh, string kind. And when you actually uh, run your, uh, when you actually compile it and when you run it, the the compiler is going to translate this record actually to a class, which is going to extend Java Lang record. And it's going to create your private final variables. It's going to create the getters. You're going to have a default OARCS constructor, uh, which is, uh, which is um, in contrast with the default constructor that we had previously with other uh, classes, which were no ARCs. Here in records, the default is OARCS constructor. It's going to do the equals hash code and two strict methods as well. Uh, this is really cool. If you haven't used Lombok to use a record, it makes it less verbose as the previous changes as well. And yeah, what else? It's immutable and it's pretty cool to use. Now we have a, uh, the same uh, less verbose structure as Lombok provided us, but in Java, in plain Java. Next, what I want to address are sealed classes, which are uh, 
answering a problem that we had for a long time, which we didn't have a very explicit solution to. Let's see this example with two classes, an animal and a monkey. Let's say that we want only monkey, or let's say another class as well, to extend the class animal. Uh, how are we going to do this? So first of all, we can see the example here. We declare both of the classes as public and only monkey extends animal. Uh, just uh, imagine that each class dec declaration is, its in, uh, is in its own file. We managed to um, do one of the requirements, monkey is extending animal. But look at uh, what happens uh, on the lines below. You can see that there is another package called come other. It's not in the same package. You import the animal and whatever class that you want extends this animal. So yeah, we did the first requirement, but this unwanted hyena is now extending animal. And we do not want this hyena to be able to extend the animal. We want only the monkey to be able to extend an animal or one or more classes that we actually want to control. And the second example, you can see that this is what we did uh, so far. We This class animal, we just made it package private. So we had this uh, implicit default modifier uh, in front of it. And now the monkey is extending the animal, but the monkey is required to be in the same package. Okay, let's say that our requirements are able to have monkey in the same package and then make it public and use it uh, elsewhere. This works, let's say. Uh, but what is the problem behind this solution? Yes, we control who is going to extend this class animal, but the main problem right now is that, for example, if we have some other class in another package and we want to import this animal and we want to create a uh, a new, let's say monkey, but we, the reference variable is going to be an animal, then we are not able to use animal since it is package private. We are not able to access it. So this creates the problem where in this case, it is uh, very, uh, it is ex extensible. We control the extensibility of the class animal, but the accessibility is restricted. We're not able to use it. We're not able to, uh, do so. So how how we are actually uh, how how are we going to actually solve this problem? Well, in Java 15, we have a new um, reserved the reserved word called sealed. So sealed is uh, is aiming to resolve this specific problem. When you create a class and you give it the sealed modifier, as you can see in the first example, you have to write as well the reserved word permits. So in this example, you see sealed class animal permits monkey and lion, which means that the animal, the animal class is sealed and it only permits the monkey class and the lion class to extend it, no one else. And in this way, if we create it public, we are giving it maximum accessibility, which means that we, are, we can use animal in each class or in the whole project or, or other projects as well. Uh, but only monkey and lion are um, allowed to extend the animal class. However, if a class is going to extend a sealed class, it needs for sure to have um, modifier be before it, which is one of the three modifiers, sealed, non-sealed, and final. So it kind of, sealed and non-sealed are kind of in the same category as final right, right now. So if we imagine a class tiger that extends the animal, but it is permitted to extend the class animal, and we, if we give it the sealed modifier, then we, we are also going to, um, pick whoever is going to extend to be extending the tiger class. Similarly here, if you have a public non-sealed class monkey extends animal, intuitively it means that anyone can extend monkey. Animal not, 
animal is only permitting monkey and lion to be uh, ex uh, to extend animal, but monkey is permitting anyone to extend uh, its class. Um, and also lion, which is final, it is uh, it means that no one can extend lion. So it's kind of uh, mixed, none or all kind of thing, sealed, non-sealed, and final. In this way, we can make all of the classes public and we can control who, who is ever going to extend and going to inherit those classes. We can actually control it uh, with the sealed and non-sealed and final class. We do not need to tweak it with the visibility modifier, such as a public or a default modifier from now on, which I think is great. Next. We're going to talk a little bit about the instance of pattern matching. So previously we had this uh, example. We have a void uh, method, which is um, accepting an object. I've specific, specifically said that the type of this object is going to be of type object, which means that if we are going to use the object inside of the method, we do not, we do not know what is the actual object st standing behind it. And we didn't, do not know what uh, fields or methods does it have. So what we do right now, sorry, we check what the, uh, what the type of the object really is with the uh, keyword instance of. So here we have said that if object is instance of monkey, then we do something. But what, what does it mean uh, when we are inside the if statement, then we know for sure that this, this object is of the class monkey uh, actually behind. So we know that this is a monkey. We typecast the object to a monkey and save it in a new variable, let's say. And then inside of this print statement, we can use the new uh, monkey variable to uh, say get ID. So let's say we want to print the ID of the monkey. We now have the monkey object. We can access its getter for the ID and we can achieve the expected result here that we wanted to do. Uh, in Java 14, pattern matching for the instance of was introduced. So what does this mean? We have the same uh, void method here with the same parameter object. Um, however, we do not need to explicitly typecast the uh, variable no more. We can write this syntax if object instance of monkey monkey, then do whatever you want to do with this variable monkey. So if you can imagine it as being declared in the same uh, statement where uh, we are checking if the object is monkey. So we translate this if statement like so. If the object is really a monkey, then declare it here. And after the first curly bracket, you have the monkey as a variable already typecasted and you can uh, do whatever you want with it. So I'm going to print out in the console that the ID of the monkey is get ID. Pretty straightforward to use, less, less verbose as well. But you say, yeah, okay, but you're actually going to, um, you're just going to save one line. What else is there with this instance of? It's not very interesting uh, as it is. Well, Java actually created flow scoping with this instance of as well. I think this is a really nice feature. Uh, it, it's, you need a little bit of adjusting to it. Uh, there is a great example on the Oracle uh, blog post about it, where they give a really interesting example that you think that you can find the answer uh, very fast, but actually uh, I did it wrong the first time because you had to uh, take into account many things uh, in order to be sure uh, what the answer is. So what is flow scoping? See, see this example, it's similar to the previous one. You have the object uh, variable as a parameter, but instead of checking that the object is instance of monkey, we're going to negate the whole expression and we're going to do the if statement again. So if the object is not an instance of monkey, we're going to print that it's not a monkey as expected. But look, in, look into the else uh, clause, we're using monkey, how? 
what is the scope of the monkey actually? Why are we able to use monkey here? Is this even going to comp compile? Well, yeah, in Java 14, this compiles perfectly due to the fact that the if statement says that if it's not a monkey, then the else statement is going to implicitly say, we know that here it is a monkey and we declared it there, but we can use it in the else statement. So if we go back one slide, we know that the monkey, similarly to other um, concepts like this pattern matching, we had the try, blo uh, the try blo block with parameters. You know that the parameters inside the try block were we were able to uh, use them inside the scope of the first bracket that goes after the try. So similarly here, we know that the scope of the monkey should be the first uh, bracket to the end of the, uh, to its closing bracket on the fourth line, which means that the scope of the monkey is only inside the if statement. After the if statement, you're not able to use monkey because it's out of scope. But here you can see that um, we know that if is not a monkey, then inside the else, we're going to have it in scope actually. And this is called flow scoping. Java is um, uh, intelligent enough to understand where the scope, where the monkey is going to be actually a monkey. And inside the scope, you can actually use the monkey. So this is kind of a new concept that we previously didn't have anything similar to it. And now we can use it, but it gets, uh, it's a little bit tricky. You have to get the hang of it with some examples in order to understand it fully. I do not think that I fully understand it yet, but uh, we can um, always uh, check inside uh, Java and Oracle to see more examples and their uh, definitions of it. Uh, one thing that I'm going uh, that I'm really uh, grateful for in Java 17 are the helpful new pointer exception messages. So, what do you mean by it? It's a pretty small change, but I think it's a very significant one. Let's say we have this example with a, a void method. Again, we have a final monkey, which is uh, going, we are going to assign a new to it, and we, we are going to print its ID. Well, it's a new, uh, the object behind uh, the monkey is new. Uh, so it's going to throw a new pointer exception, even though it's going to compile. And previously in Java 11, you can see on the lines below that it says exceptions in thread main, new pointer exception. We have all seen this uh, in one case or another. And it says at which line. So you start digging up the code, you start debugging, you go to the line and you're trying to see what is going to produce this new pointer exception. Because when a new pointer exception is placed, you know that the variable is actually new where we expect it not to be new. Um, but it, uh, let's imagine a line when you have a lot of reference variables, let's say 10 reference variables. And when it says that you have a new pointer exception of this line, you're actually starting to going like, yeah, but where? What is new? What is going to raise this new pointer exception? This is not, this is not very helpful. I, can, I should start the bug now. I should go start doing it like or line by line or for the ones that are more familiar with the debugger, we can actually inspect the values of all of the variables till this line. So to see what is going to be new, but then we are going to think that something is new where it, could be, it could be new, of course, but it's not going to raise the new ex pointer exception. And in Java 14, we actually have this um, uh, solved. You can see that uh, we have uh, one more line bef uh, beneath it where it says cannot invoke monkey get ID because local one, which is the variable is no. So we know actually right now, what is going to be producing this no pointer exception. And I think this is going to make our work a little bit faster because we can see the no pointer exception. We can understand what exactly on this line is going to produce the new pointer exception and we can move on with our life, which is I think pretty helpful. And I guess it was uh, the other changes are uh, fairly small. 
Next, we have the compact number formatting, which is a small change as well, but in some cases it could be very useful. Um, so in Java 12, a new class was introduced, which is called compact number format. Um, so how, how can we get this uh, instance of the compact number format? We do it through the new method get compact number instance, which is a static method for the number format class. It, it accepts two parameters, which is one of them is going to be a locale, and the other one is going to be a number format style class, which is also a new enum value, which contains two values, short and long. So in this case, uh, you can see that I've used an example with locale of English and a short number format style. And when you print out uh, a number with this format, it's actually going to be introduced as 1K or 1M, which is going to stand for 1000 or 1 million. But this is going to be represented in this way since we have explicitly said that the number format style should be short. Similarly, you have the long format where it's the same example. The only change is that we said that the number format style should be long. With the same numbers, we're producing to the console 1,000 with words and 1 million with words as well. So this is, again, um, it's an interesting change where you can actually parse different numbers. Uh, so you can uh, do them, for example, in emails or text. You can just parse them with this format and you can have the actual number. Uh, next, uh, similarly to the compact number format, we have date period. They're pretty similar, but with dates. Uh, and this is the support for this pattern of B. So it was introduced in Java 16. And pattern B is going to say in which period of the day this uh, local time is going to be uh, resolved to. So if we look at the first example, we say that this date formatter, we are going to format the local time. We're going to use the static constructor and we're going to pass the value eight, so eight o'clock. But eight o'clock is in the morning. So Java knows that eight is in the morning. It's, we are going to print to the console in the morning. So similarly, 13 is going to be afternoon, evening, night, and zero, zero, midnight. Um, why uh, should we care about this? It's a pretty small change, but sometimes it could be significant due to the fact that um, a lot of uh, times we need to send an email to someone. And let's say that we have um, a reservation date where we are going to reserve something and we're going to, let's say, a uh, flying ticket. We're going to uh, be receiving an email about it. And we want to know when it is. And when when you want to say, um, let's say you don't want to explicitly say in the email uh, somewhere in the text, the time that it is, you want to just parse it to a specific day period. You can use this and let's say you have booked this in the morning, let's say, and then you can explicitly say, it, for example, uh, what is the hour? And I think this is great for parsing and for text usages. And I'm going to uh, finish the language changes that we had so far with <clears throat> a very simple and intuitive change, which is stream to list. Uh, as many of you know, we had streams uh, that you have to uh, do a number of things, and then you have to close them with a closing uh, met uh, method, which is going to actually invoke the stream and make it run. And one of them, one of them is collect. So collect is a ending uh, method for the stream. And for example, let's say we have uh, an animal stream which is consisting of monkey, uh, of a monkey, a lion, and a tiger. Then you can uh, do something with it, and then at the end you can collect everything with collectors to list. Um, and then this is going to trigger the stream to run it and then to return the list of animals that we needed uh, to have. Uh, since this is a, I think that it's a very used 
feature and everyone was doing collect collectors to list, it has uh, a lot of usages. Uh, Java developers decided that they're just simply going to introduce it as a method in the stream uh, API as well. And you can see here, it's the same example. You have the same stream of a monkey, lion, and a tiger, but at the end, you just say the stream to list. So produces the same output, but it's less verbose and it's much easier to do. Um, I haven't uh, found the chance to see if there, are, uh, there is for set or other things. So I think that the list was more popular. So that's what the de developers chose to do. But at least for me, I have used it in a lot of code examples, this uh, uh, collect collectors list. So I think this, this is going to be much appreciated, at least by me, for a lot of things in the code. Um, so what else? So there are a lot more changes such as security patches. There are also things that are deprecated. There are things that are removed uh, from other versions as well. Uh, there are uh, even other uh, things that I have not covered uh, thoroughly in this presentation. Uh, and for this, I can all, always say that you can refer to the Oracle documentation. They have a thorough re release. Uh, notes where you can see all of the changes um, that uh, there between versions that were introduced uh, in uh, uh, in broad description. Um, also, uh, the changes that I just showed you are more or less um, they are more or less uh, the main language changes that you should expect if you switch, for example, from Java 11 to Java version 18. And I think that they're uh, the most, um, they're going to be the most used ones as well. So thank you for your attention. This was my uh, presentation for Java and I'm going to uh, leave the rest of the time for any questions that you may have. I saw that there are some questions in the chat probably, but I have closed it. So I could probably start with it. Uh... Um, so I saw that Christoph Zabianski has said, uh, has probably have a question. Can you please uh, explain a little bit uh, what you meant by your uh, comment and in which slide this for which topic? Yes, uh, sure. uh, it was just an answer to Pablo uh, because Pablo suggested uh, regarding this to um, to list um, uh, to list uh, comment that um, in your example, we could use RSS list. And I just wanted to express that, uh, yes, indeed, we could use in this example, but in reality, sometimes um, just reality is not as this example. So you, you just sometimes have the stream. And uh, as uh, Andre mentioned, you can have something additional, some filtering, etc., in the stream, and then you can directly switch to um, convert to, to list. And and uh, this is really convenient. Uh, so basically, that's what I what I meant by my comment. Okay, and Babu, yeah, uh, one thing else that I want to probably I haven't expressed it uh, very well as well. This uh, to list as you you see here is actually absolutely the same as in behavior as collect collectors to list. So we have this uh, behavior previously. It's not, not a new feature. It's the same behavior, but with a different syntax that you can use an alternative syntax, which is going to make it uh, less verbose. Uh, does the performance improve or worsen with new Java versions being released? Uh, thank you for the question, Michalo. Uh, to be honest, I'm not really sure. Uh, I haven't looked at the performance with new Java versions. Uh, at least I know that between Java 8 and Java 11, there is a significant um, performance improvement in one sector, um, at least, uh, because they introduced, uh, I don't know, I don't, do not remember um, 
what was the term exactly called, but they were like uh, not required modules, which means that when you bundle the package, when you do it in a jar, only the required things that you require from different packages are going to be bundled inside of it. And you do not have to bundle the whole thing together, uh, which kind of improved uh, performance and uh, as well uh, memory, which means that you need less disk space to have an image. Uh, and that was great in Java 11. So using this uh, example as a, uh, as a transa a tra with a transactional uh, analogy, I think that it should be improved. At least that's why they're doing it. They're trying to improve everything, security, performance, um, syntax, bugs and everything. So I assume that the performance is improved, but I'm, I cannot say for sure if it's true or with how much as well. Do you have any other questions? Okay, if not, I'll probably pass it to Arthur then. <laughs> 